This is the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl. I can't even believe we're up to episode 84. So, um, what's interesting today is that it's been a really bad day for right-wing America. Oh, boo-hoo. Um, first of all, the Trump casino in AC in Atlantic City. Which 3,000 was, sticks of dynamite. Never better applied unless they were up his fucking ass. Go ahead. Full-on demolished. Very symbolic. Taken down. It's one of his biggest economic failures. It was talked about forever. Completely demolished. They were selling tickets. It was a huge spectacle. <laughs> Crowds cheering. And then... Do che- tell. Check this out. It's very intuitive. I'm an asshole for even saying it's intuitive, but I turned on, because I do listen to right-wing radio, because I'm genuinely curious. You have to know what the enemy's doing. Whatever reason, I'm actually curious. I turned on Rush Limbaugh today. (laughs) And and I remember... Look, I've turned against him forever. You turned on him. I like that phrase. I turned on him. At noon. And, And... to the magnificent. As song. I turned on it on, it is absolutely true. I, I thought to myself, I think he's gonna die soon. Suddenly, there's this weird montage audio montage, and then his current wife goes on air. His and, current wife? Yeah, he's had like two or three of them. He almost died in your arms tonight. Almost he died in your ears. Goes on air to announce. That he had passed. Oh, that you know morning. what? I mean, hell. Does it have enough room? Well, you know, this was interesting about Rush Limbaugh for me, at least, um, because <sighs> the content is so evil on many levels. Yet, in the era of only opinion pieces in hijacking all journalism at this point, including the New York Times and the uh, uh, Washington Post, he was kind of like one of the foundations of the the Reagan era, um, and I'm not justifying this, Supreme Court, uh, 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 Supreme Court, um, what's it, realization, that basically allows free market propaganda in all media, and, and, and his career was launched by Bill Clinton's presidency, in short, as a performer. And I do listen to Rush Limbaugh, uh, or I did, even though I completely disagree with him on essentially everything. Okay, somebody that I did agree with on a few major points also passed this week, which was Larry Flint. Now, Hustler, call it what you will, and no one can ever forget the meat grinder cover But Larry Flint was really a First Amendment activist. I mean, what I loved about him is that he would pay people and they would come forth with incriminating evidence, all true, either about religious liars, right-wing liars, political liars. And, you know, the man took a bullet for freedom of speech. Now, yeah, it was a sleazy magazine, but in the era... Let's talk about politically in the same way that Playboy politically. I mean, you know, two, two, ver- two opposite extremes, but still naked women selling basically great interviews or great political controversies. So, Lydia, what, what kind of blows my mind as you bring this up, Larry Flint, Chick Corea, and Rush Limbaugh all died within a week, <laughs> and they're all genius nuts. Like, they're all virtuoso of the insane nut, nut cases. I mean I mean Chikoria. Yeah. Scientologist nut. Absolute well it was a uh, jazz virtuoso insane It was a good week for death. Per, per person. Seriously. Rush Limbaugh, this is what's insane. I, 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 I can't I, say I'm going to miss him. That's fine. But I'll say this about Rush Limbaugh because I, I I've listened to him quite a bit. Three hours a day, five hour, five days a week, hate speeches, monologues, no guests. Okay, Tim, Mo- hang on. Mo- what, monologues. What, what, are we, what are On the- opiates. He was literally like cranked okay. on opiates. I understand. Doing like insane okay. 
rage speeches. I understand what I've been doing wrong. I was never on opiates because they don't work on me, stubborn as I am. I've been doing hate speeches my entire fucking life. Three hours on the radio is a big, no wonder he died. It, it is exhausting. But what the hell? And I guess, I mean, I have to base it really on gender here. I hate to say it, but I mean, as a happy hater, as somebody who has basically attacked everyone Rush Limbaugh supported, I guess that's where I went wrong. I don't know. I'm not going to turn my turn the other cheek into another kind of uh, tongue, but maybe 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 I just will have to as a comedic ploy to gain a bigger audience. Just say it. Uh, Rush Rush Limbaugh's biggest motivation, psychologically speaking, was the disapproval of his dad on him because he was a college dropout and his dad was into like earnest white man like hard education or, or, or white men's dominance okay, on all right, culture okay, okay. And, and he's trying to win over his dead dad okay okay stop uh, right for the stop, rest of his okay, life stop right there exactly speaking true. Of, speaking about dads in the 1940s butt plugs <laughs> were marketed as a headache remedy Dr. Young's ideal rectal dilators, which were created in the 1890s, actually, were not marketed as a sexual object, but as a serious medical tool. I know I always feel better once I put a butt plug up. I'm not your ass, of course, Tim. That would be rude. But the same way that, you know, electrical vibrators were originally conceived as a health device because... They thought that if women orgasmed, it would help with their hysteria. Hysteria meaning from the womb. Anyway, there was much quackery in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s. But the beauty of Dr. Young's ideal rectal dilators, which was said to cure headaches, baldness, the sniffles, is the size of these things. Also piles and constipation. They're really quite beautiful and they look like they're made of onyx i'm not sure what they were made of probably hard plastic but uh the other subject that really interested me this week because you know i'm very interested in bacteria and viruses being that we are the sure. vehicles of them and we know that the world population is estimated by 20 i can't even nobody can count this high by 2050 be 9.5 billion People, but one idea that's coming to fruition is using bacteria in devices called microbial fuel cells, MFCs for short. And these fuel cells, they rely on the ability of certain naturally occurring microorganisms that have the ability to breathe metals. So they're doing these experiments, and so far they've created these small experiments where waste, urine, feces are generating, you know, uh, LED small fans, and they're hoping that they can find a way, instead of using fuels, that fossil fuels that we now use, to use actually human waste as something to power. So in other words, instead of shitting on the fucking planet with the debris of fossil fuels, we'll actually be using our piss and shit to fuel things. I just think that's an absolutely fantastic idea. So on the road... <laughs> and, and this is a, a big uh, conversation with touring bands because the in intimacy is so great. Is when you get to Germany, and it's referred to as the German shelf, which is basically the flush toilet has not just a bowl of water, it's got a shelf. So that you can examine in case there's anything wrong because well, that, we all know that... Your feces can tell a lot about that's you. The, that's the whole point. But then you're hanging with it for a while. <laughs> and um, what I always couldn't relate to with that is the greatest minds on the planet. <laughs> All the engineers just want that away and gone. And yet... Germans want to hang out with it look, for we a know, while. We know the Germans can be quite scatological. But look, uh, what what obsesses me is I don't understand why more Americans don't have bidets. Now, because I think that is a very hygienic 
way, and instead of having to examine your waste material, how about, and or using a ton of toilet paper, what about just cleansing yourself down there? And now there is a product called Tushy, which I've seen advertised on TV recently. I think, you know, but there's nothing quite like an Italian or French or a Spanish bidet. It just makes everything more hygienic. Fine. And, you know, I like when people kiss my ass, so there you go. I wanted no. to be clean. And, 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 and the requests in other countries are different than the requests here. But, but that, I'm going to digress a little bit. What a tough week for right-wing America. I mean, speaking uh, of assholes, uh, uh, we're back to that. Okay, go ahead. So Trump's declaring war on Mitch McConnell. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Right. Rush Limbaugh dies. The Trump casino that was already vacant. And, uh, 3,000 sticks of dynamite. Should have gone right up his ass. Also, the polar vortex on the on the red okay, space. Okay, do you know why that it, happened? It, it, it's, Excuse well, me, let's well, talk there, about there's it. There's a lot of reasons why it happened. I know why it that, happened. That, that's that's a different me. point. Tim, there is a specific but, reason. Uh, I, I'm going to roll with this, which is, guess who got really fucked on this one? The state of Texas. And the who, state who, the only state the, that has its own power grid. They have their own because the state of Texas believes in anti-Fed uh, off the grid. Whatever. Exceptionalism. I well, exceptionalism. When was the last time there was that much snow in Texas? There was, you know what? It was fifty degrees colder uh, in uh, Texas than Brooklyn yesterday. A uh, hundred years ago. That's not the point. The point is just like. Florida and all these fucking places during, 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 during COVID. I don't like taxes. Well, guess what? Taxes are supposed to, if you don't have a dysfunctional state, pay for your security. And guess why it's falling apart? You have no security. Get back to work, poor people, well, you know and what? die. Excuse you me. Know, that, that's basically Excuse the message. Me. The newly mullet-headed Ted Cruz is not in Texas. He's in Washington as well as his other Texan cronies. Let me explain to you why the polar vortex has been so damaging to the South right now, and that's because the Arctic is much warmer, so it's actually pushing the jet stream down further than it's ever been. So therefore, places that usually don't see snow, except 100 years ago, are getting absolutely inundated, and that's why these ice and uh, snowstorms are 2,000 miles long. I mean, stretching from Texas to Maine, outlandish. But however, oh, you've heard me say it before. I've always said global warming is chilly. Sure. But, it's, yeah. Tim, you know very well how I feel about breeding, especially in this day and age. I think it's vulgar, it's unsafe, it's insane. You know, I always like to tell women, if, really, you want to have a baby? Do you think a baby wants to have you it's amazing um when we're on the road and i roll into different cities with uh new families who love me and love lydia whatever whoever they are in the rela relationship that what that is and nine out of ten times they kind of in a weird way say the hint that our lifestyle is somehow kind of selfish. Oh, and, okay, and, 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 all right. And, and I, I always respond like, is that more selfish than insisting upon making more of your genes? Now, now, of course, I'm into selfish behavior. Well, excuse me. And, 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 the word, and, and, hang on, Tim. The word selfish has a very bad connotation here, which it shouldn't. It should actually mean self-centered to care for yourself enough to not damage the environment further. And speaking of damaging, if there wasn't enough moral, intellectual, intelligent, psychological, and psycho psychic reasons not to have children, finally... The U.S. Uh, House of Representatives, I can't even believe they re released this report because they lie about everything, released a report about how Gerber, Beach, Beach Nut, Happy Baby, so many brands of baby food are contaminated with toxins and heavy metals. Mm -hmm. Look, we know that most of the food we eat is poison, but excuse me, if you're breeding now... And look, oh, yes, we need good people in the world. There's no guarantee you're going to get... You might get a fucking monster. And by the way, adopt, if you don't mind. 
The thing is, it's such a poisoned and contaminated time. There is no excuse for that vulgar and self and selfish need to respect what your insane hormones are telling you. Just stop it. Okay, Tim. The template for that basically was was Nestle, and there's still a big influence on preying on the solutions of, I wouldn't say lazy parenting, basically parents that have no choice but to feed processed food to their fucking kids. And I mean, I grew up with like cereal and all that shit, which is the biggest scam uh, you can possibly imagine. What's weird is, you know what, oatmeal, oatmeal, which they feed it to people in orphanages, all of the food that was originally considered kind of poor people's food, soups, pickled food, porridge, has a lot more nutrients than the crappy cereals that have been invented full of sugar and all other kinds of crap. Anyway, enough about that. Well, I, I, I gotta run with this because why these things were even presented to begin with was part of a evolution of a middle class uh, workforce Convenience. In, in the 20th century industrial age. So right now you have the biggest generational dissonance of power in the history of humanity. So what I'm getting at is with all due respect to the smart minds of the Nancy Pelosi's and the Mitch McConnell's and the Chuck Schumer's, the checks and balances historically have been the transition of power through the ages and different generations. So if there's a flaw in the infrastructure or a construct, you can have a distribution of power that's reasonable that you have different angles of perspective. Now, not allowed. Let's boil it down to this, Tim. If anybody wants to have a baby, I'm an orphan. If they have a million dollars to waste, I'm available. That's all I'm saying. Let's just, you know, c c carry on. I, I mean... Let's just get back to reality for a minute, because another I thing that's been bugging me, I know you are, besides being toxic baby food, Trump and one of his many pending lawsuits, the Trump Hotel Tower in Chicago is being sued, and this is, they should be sued for more, for $12 million, because they've been dumping, and they've been told not to, but they've been doing it for years, their toxic waste directly into the water source of Chicago. Now, I mean, he's also coming up for his tax dealings in New York, of course, undervaluing or overvaluing, depending on whether he's trying to get money or avoid taxes. He's going down for something, and I cannot wait, because the Orange Clown King should be in orange, sitting in Rikers with one of Dr. Young's butt plugs. So, so what's amazing about that is Bill Clinton, uh, who's extremely corrupt in spite of his intelligence uh, is a litigious genius and photographic memory and, and, and Donald Trump is not that he's an idiot uh, who can't remember well, anything well, Donald Trump has his own clear clear power he, he's a narcissist doesn't matter he, underachiever he, <laughs> overachiever so, as much as I can criticize Donald Trump he still has tremendous support but this is what this is where it's going and this, this is actually why the Democratic Party is so fucked right now, is because Bill Clinton's a litigious genius. The amount of lawsuits that were on him and his family after his presidency was all over the top. Somehow, he managed to navigate that, and he turned into a money machine that has never been seen before. The modern-day lim limousine liberal is, about Bill Clinton. is the Clinton machine. Okay, okay, but hang on. I, Trump has lost Trump's everything. Trump's about to head into something that's the way opposite. bigger than Bill Clinton ever and, had and to. The opposite. And I don't think Trump has the same... Uh, lawyers? Well, not just lawyers. First of all, nobody wants... He doesn't wants have the same chops in terms of... Look, We're about to see. We're about nobody to see. wants to work with him because he doesn't fucking pay anybody. Who tried to defend his ridiculous claims of voter fraud? A bunch of fucking idiots. And, you know, he won't even deal with Rudolph Giuliani, probably because he doesn't want to pay him. Nobody is going to defend Trump of any value because they know he's gotten away with near murder and now murder 
uh, six people died during the riot at the Capitol. Two cops committed suicide. 130 cops were hurt. There was so much physical damage to people. And also the NAACP has just decided to sue right. Trump right. under a 1871 so, Ku Klux so Klan law. That, that's why McConnell's like, let here we go. It, it's basically the O.J. Simpson uh, verdict was basically... What killed Robert Kardashian? So, so basically what went down the other day with the Senate, I stand by this, and it's not even my own opinion. I I love to criticize the Democratic establishment. But they gave a great I, they th gave a great presentation. Bob. They they won public support. Yeah. They won public support. They had a great video demonstration. And there's the reality. And half of the Republicans who were under siege didn't even know what was really fucking happening. And you know what? Now they do, and they still don't fucking care because they're sucking Trump's bootstraps because they're afraid of him, they're ridiculous, and they're going out. And isn't that the positive point you wanted to make, Tim? Well, what I'm a little jealous of, because uh, I love being a fucking nutcase, the level of sociopathy of all these people, the Marco Rubios oh. and the Ted Cruz's, they, they're bitch-slapped by Trump so hard. And they come and, sucking and, up. I can't even fucking believe it. It's so insane. I've uh, never seen... Well, the worst of all, though, is, of course, Lindsey Graham, because uh, what did I just read today? That he will change his mind if you chase him down in the airport. And there you go. Yes, he will. Well, so one of my best friends is from South Carolina, and one of my heroes, South Carolina spirit is a special thing including a closeted homosexual like uh, Lindsey Graham. I hate the motherfucker, but it's such a violent, psycho fucking state. First bullet shot. Well, the only good thing about him is that he's queer. The bad thing about him is he won't admit it. The other horrible thing is that he's a total flip-flopper. And there's nothing worse than a queer in flip-flops. Ah. Uh, Just saying. All right, tie it up, Timmy. All right, so I honestly think for everyone that was crying about Donald Trump, I, I really feel in my gut there's a silver lining that he's get, he's literally going to bring down the Republican Party. The tragedy is that it's emboldened the right center ele you, ele element of the de Democratic Party. Do, but don't you think that the right wing should now be called the wrong wing? I mean, they should change their name. So, so one of my best friends is from South Carolina, registered Democrat, but he's so conservative. He's like old, like pre-Lincoln uh, uh, Democrat. Different point. Point is this, Democrat or Republican, most of them suck. Republicans mostly worse, willing to lie about anything, willing to lie in order to think that maybe the people that supported Trump are going to support them. They're going to be very sad in their loss. I was quite happy to hear Burr of Louisiana, who voted to con... The thing is, Burr had two, two speeches ready, one to convict and one to not convict, and he decided to wait to hear what was actually being presented, and he decided he had to vote to convict. And in the meantime, members of families of people that voted to convict are disowning people. This is how brainwashed people are. I'm going to disown you because you're following the Democrats, the Devil's Party. Look, they're all corrupt. They're all corporate puppets. Nobody making that much money should be deciding what we can do. Democrats are putting on a good vein, a good face. Good luck, motherfuckers. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl. <laughs> This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl and our special guest, the multi-talented, multi-dimensional Jarbeau, musician, keyboardist, vocalist, painter, gardener. I know there's <laughs> there's a few things I'm leaving out. If you want to fill us in, go ahead. Hi, <laughs> hi Jarbeau. Hi, how are you? I just got to um, doing my bike rides. I'm a little sweaty, but... I like my women wet. Yeah, I've been painting all day, so I had to decompress from that. 
Where are you living? Roswell, Georgia. Okay. Which is north of Atlanta. My brother, my brother lives around there. You were you were born in the South and you're back there again. I wanted to ask you before we get into the arty stuff, what do you think both the, <laughs> the benefits and maybe the deficits of being born in the South and, and spending quite a bit of time there now? So as, as a kid, for instance, did you like being in Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia? Yeah, for sure, um, because it was very inspirational in terms of uh, eccentricity. What I saw was extreme um, welcoming to eccentricity, and uh, especially the street performers and NOLA and, you know, just the, the mask, the costumes. I mean, that had a big impression on me, and then music everywhere. And, and also, also I, I, the multicultural aspect of it. Um, I was uh, surrounded by um, a lot of African-American uh, women and when I was growing up and they were very, um, uh, would tell me stories and sing to me. And I, I kind of feel like that influenced uh, a lot of the way that I approached some of my voices. So, I mean, musically and just performing wise, it was uh, a good uh, uh, education. What, what, how old were you when you were in, in uh, New Orleans? What age little kid, you? little back and forth, like even in Mississippi, we, we, my mother and I would go there because she, they were all born there on my mother's side of the family. They're all from there. And my mother and my grandmother um, and my grandmother was, they were born, they were married there. And so I had, a, I had relatives there. So we're going all the time to visit them. And I have early memories of an ice cream parlor with black and white tiles on the floor and little glass tables, very Parisian looking. And, and I remember, um, you know, tap dancing and then flipping, being given a nickel or a dime to go down and get ice cream. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really, I really are great memories. What do you like? The, the lace curtains at the windows. Uh, I mean, I just really, it was vivid memories for me. What do you like about living in the South now? Well, the thing about the metro area is that it's actually uh, very different. It's very liberal and it's very um, creative, very open. And so I think that it's, it's a lot different than, you know, some of the other parts of, of the state, for example, like we went blue this year and we have, you know, got two senators elected, Democrat senators elected. And so I think that it's a lot more liberal than you know, than people may realize. And plus there's a huge music scene, um, huge hip hop scene down here and, and a lot of record labels and performers and clubs. And, and that all kind of, it influences the energy for me here. Georgia, Georgia's changed a lot. Also a lot of uh, television movie production has really come in. Yeah, so it's just, but it's there's, just a, there's a community uh, a little bit south, about half an hour from, or so from the airport. It's called Serenby. And Serenby is a place I was going to all the time before the COVID-19 situation. Uh, thriving arts community. And they had a playhouse. And they also had uh, dance performances down there and art shows. And the, the productions, the live plays, the productions were beyond. They were like edgy off Broadway. I mean, they were really, okay. really spectacular. Playbill was coming down, giving rave reviews. And so that was a, and this community is really incredible. It's all sustainable. Like if you live down there, the farm her, cause it's a woman the farm her, she's in charge of the growing the, the food down there. So you get the fresh vegetables and the fresh food. It's got tons of acreage with trails. You don't need a car. You can walk everywhere. Well, well that's what I want to bring, bring up about the, because Atlanta at least is the, it's the modern American infrastructure the, the post fifties one. It's a driving city, but it's slowly at least the last time I was there, it's kind of, there's these little clusters of walking, walking areas. So, yeah. so that's kind of, it's kind of evolving, at least from my outside. Yeah, perspective. no, it is in town. It is. And Serenby was built that way. It was built around the idea of a Hamlet. So there's different neighborhoods and you can, with different art, you know, architectural uh, look to it. Motto, for example, is the one I really like. That one is Swedish. And then that's a community that's based on, uh, you can age in place and it also has the kids there. So it's like the, the progressive education for the young children, as well as the health center, the Zen spa, the, the whole thing is down there. <laughs> and it's really cool. Sure, but you got into music at a very early age. And it's kind of interesting to me because I wanted to also talk about both your parents were FBI agents. Now, 
Does that mean you couldn't get away with anything or you learned how to really get away with stuff? And did they encourage you into music? Well, no, my mother was not musical at all. She liked tunes that were like overtly kind of, you know, tap dancing and lively, but she herself couldn't uh, sing or compose. She kind of had a tenor, you might call it. And, and uh, dad was an extremely musical, beautiful singing voice. He could play guitar, he could play the keyboard, he could play the piano, the organ. Uh, and, and he, and also was an amazing artist, wow. He could draw anything and and he was also very crafty like anything that broke he could fix it and any kind of he was always making me jewelry he was truly i take after him i think <laughs> because he he really was uh a renaissance man making things yeah so he was responsible for um as a really tiny little kid he was responsible for putting me on his lap in front of the, key, the organ the keyboard and like you know play this note sing that note sing that note and so really early on, he was um, encouraging me to sing and, and uh, I got all kinds of lessons, organ lessons, you know, piano, lessons, Hammond organ, and all this stuff was very early on. And then the choirs came and it was just <laughs> all kinds of choirs. And I was pushed to go into every choir, church choir, school choir, 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 choir. And did you have yeah. to go to church? Did you have to go to church every Sunday? He well, it was very interesting upbringing um, because mother is Roman Catholic, very Catholic. Sweet. So the children were raised Catholic and went to mass. And um, my father was very interesting. He I don't know if he was agnostic or what he was for a while. Uh, he had a Buddha in the house and was burning incense <laughs> and he had a book, um, The Compassionate Buddha by his bedside. And he and he would uh, sometimes drive us when he was in town to mass, but he would sit in the parking lot. And he developed an interest in photography. So I started taking photographs of trees and stuff while he was waiting for us. It was interesting. When your parents retired and you grew up in the South, did you ever talk to them about their work in the FBI and, and particularly maybe the civil rights and the FBI's presence? Well, I think uh, I think that that could have had a lot to do initially with us uh, winding up where we wound up. Was okay. that? Um, because where was he born? Where, or where Chicago. Were they born? Chicago. He was born in yep. Chicago yep. and raised in Chicago, and uh, I think that they. Uh, didn't consider themselves Southerners at all because Nola is not the South. It's a very different place. And so I think, you know, they were able to, they had, they could adapt and they could fit in. It must've been, it must've been interesting. They met in Washington, DC at the FBI building and they were both, um, you know, in the shooting, the shooting range and they met there. And then um, I met a few of my just... boyfriends at the shooting range. <laughs> <laughs> and then he, uh, I think that, you know, probably their interesting careers. Now, he also uh, had another uh, degree. So he also, not only did he remain in law enforcement his entire life, but he, he also uh, was in the, in the forestry. And he was investigating arsonists and things like that. And he was gone from a lot of my childhood. He would be gone for months at a time. So I think this is a lot of learning how to entertain yourself as a kid. Because I was really kind of a, a lonely kid, alone all the time. And um, Your I only child? Just, no, two brothers. But they were born, I was a late kid. I was born really when my mother was quite quite old. And so I think that they had left home. I mean, I remember them. They were there when I was very little. But then they went off to school. So I was pretty much alone when they went off to school. Like they were in college, you know, and, I, and living on campus. And I was still a little kid. So it's like I didn't, even though I, they influenced me a lot, they were always so much older, you know, that they weren't there when I was growing up. What drove you to go to New York? And, and when was that, Jarba? Because that's where we met. We met, I think, in the mid-80s in New York. We almost met on West Peachtree Street when you yeah. played a show. That was during the two Almost, what happened, honey? Were you shy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it was the tour for Queen of Siam, as I recall. Well, it must've been Eight Eyes Spy because I never uh, toured Eight the Eyes album. Spy. I never Eight toured Eyes the Spy. album Queen of Siam. Well, that was anyway. the album that I had at the time. Okay. But anyway, um, yeah, it was quite a buzz that you were performing. Anyway, we met, uh, was it at, the Sar the Sarasols, I think the first time Sarasols maybe. Sharp, well, you have an incredible you have an incredible memory, honey. I, I think I realized this from talking to you the other day. You I do. I think it was the pasta dinner that they would have at their place. 
Let me describe the Sarasol for a minute. They were a Swiss couple, kind of rich junkies, but they'd have these dinners. (laughs) That's what they were. They'd have these dinners for all of us starving people, Swan, Sonic Youth, various people. They were kind of collectors of hungry artists. So I'm pretty sure that was the first time. And um, but anyway, I mean, I, we started going to your performances, your spoken word stuff. And there was a famous show at Danceteria that I'll never forget. You were performing upstairs, Danceteria. Swans were doing a show downstairs. And the reason why it stands out for me is Michael had had a serious problem with his teeth and he was on antibiotics and he hadn't, he wasn't able to drink for two weeks. And it was a spectacular performance. And I remember Kim saying in the dressing room, like, that was just incredible. Like, that's possibly the best you've ever been. And he was sober. And so we're all like patting him on the back, like, you can do it. You <laughs> okay, can but, do you, it. but you didn't answer the question. What oh. made you first go oh. to New York? And what made you even go to that show? So you're going to New York. What you go in there for, honey? Well, okay. Well, we, a little group of us had um, a, like a little art zine, in those days, zines. And uh, we were interested in industrial culture, music, SPK, and, you know, bands like that. And so there was a radio show at Georgia Tech University, and that's where I first heard Swans. In particular, I heard the song Power for Power, and I liked it because when you listen to it, it sounds, it's very chant-like, and it sounded very, um, you know, ritualistic to me. And it caught my ear and I, you know, and I I found out who it was. I couldn't find the record anywhere. I went to the radio station and I borrowed their copy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I had it for years. I may still have it. Yeah. So there was an address on there for the lyric sheet. Ah. So I wrote neutral records. I want the lyric sheet. So a long time went by. Finally, I got this typewritten piece of paper in the mail with a little <laughs> note scribbled on there from Michael. So then I decided, because I love the, the music so much, and by the way, at that time I was weightlifting and I was at the crossroads mm-hmm. in my life when I thought I'm either going to become like an amateur, you know, bodybuilder, weightlifter woman, mm-hmm. or I'm going to pursue <clears throat> music. Mm-hmm. I'm going to become a performer. And I was really attracted to what swans were doing. Excuse and me, I have, I, have to, <laughs> I have to say this. You became a musician who was involved in music that was heavier than 600 pounds on your back. So actually, <laughs> you were a weight, you were a musical weightlifter. It just well, makes know, so I, much sense. I lifted weights and, and worked out to that album. <laughs> That's that album inspired me to move and to, to lift weights and to be stronger and harder, you know. And of course, those are the lyrics, you know, hard, big, strong boss. And so, anyway, so, 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 so that, that interest that I imagine, you know, they did cross. And I understood immediately that those words were metaphors. I understood immediately that those words were written by, you know, an intelligent mind. And I was very drawn. And I, and by the way, here's the sin I'm going to commit here. I saw it as an art project. I'm sorry. I, oh, I, did, yeah. not, I did not see it as I did. Not oh, they see hate it. when you say that. I know. <laughs> I didn't see it as a, I didn't see it as a rock band. I thought it was an art project. Right. We decided we're going to interview this band for the zine. So I went up there and I uh, also had presented a package of the stuff I was doing at the time in art galleries, which was inspired by the industrial culture movement. This is well before I was familiar with certain other performers that have done stuff like this. I was using contact mics and all this stuff. I was smearing, you know, blood on my body nude and doing all this stuff in art galleries. Who could resist a a musical weightlifter who's nude with blood smeared on them presenting (laughs) you gifts? No wonder you were so incredibly irresistible. (laughs) Who's going to resist so, that? Well, Who's I had calluses. Win? I had calluses on my hands from doing the bondo boxing. I was a bondo. I was studying bondo boxing, and kickboxing, and uh, so I, uh, when I went up there, um, <laughs> I guess you had the calluses, and I and I wore athletic clothing, and I think that I was uh, at that time fairly, you know, a lot more muscular. I mean, I had, you know, the, the, the ripped abs and all this. I had all my hair shaved off, so I think I just presented myself as rather androgynous. 
and strong and um, and also very uh, motivated to get up there and be part of that scene. And I was very overwhelmed with everything. There were a lot of art galleries. I was meeting, you know, all kinds of people that were just blowing my mind, you know, Lydia, Mars DNA, Jim, I mean, everybody you could think of in that scene, I was meeting casually on the si sidewalk when we were walking around. And I was so, this is where it's happening. This is where it has to be. And, and the thing was, is to me, it was a decision. I'm either going to move to Berlin and try to work with Einstein and Neubauten, or I'm going to move to New York City and work with Swans. It was that cut and dry. Do you th I, I think you did the right thing. <laughs> so how did you infiltrate Swans? How did, you, how did you ever get the audition? Here's where her FBI training came in, because she yeah. proposes to do an interview, but really it's an interrogation, trying to find the way in, and she did it. Come on, tell us the tell us the bottom line. Yeah, how would you infiltrate? How would you infiltrate this the band? Just unstoppable drive. I <laughs> I was unstoppable, and I think I was an overwhelming uh, uh, presence at that time. And I think I went to a rehearsal. I was not allowed into the back room where they rehearsed. You never call the setup, Lydia. And I was only in the front room, which at that time was raw space. It was horrible. And so I had, to, and so I could hear the music because, of course, you could hear it up the street. It was so loud. But I wasn't allowed to go in there, which was probably good because it probably would have made me deaf. But anyway, so, so, so I heard it. And then I met everyone when they came out. And I realized uh and i had a, i had a mentor who was a professor who was living up there and he told me when i told him about my fascination with with this project swans he told me find the person who is the mind behind it focus on that person mm -hmm. and you will come up there and you will be part of it he says wow. only focus on that so i did i learned that was michael and so i just aimed everything I had at, at him. And I mean, everything that I could possibly offer. I had, I had, I sent it, I made a tape of me doing all kinds of sounds and, and, and I was working with a 16 second digital delay. I was making all kinds of things that were really kind of cool. You were and more, so, you were far more musical anyway already. And I just want to interject and say yeah. this, having seen the swans many times in the early day, they right. were absolutely the most bombastic violent to the soul and really in a sense polluting and cleansing at the same time there was right. something that was so filthy yet pure and i still think that the book that mike Girard wrote the consumer is one of my favorite books mm -hmm. and you came in and decided and brought something totally different because look it's like with teenage jesus or swans you can only go so far with that you have to then go somewhere else you have to. And I think you came in at the right time because they were already mm -hmm. at the pinnacle of right. the brutal, throbbing, voluminous, painful, beautiful right. pinnacle that they could reach. They had to go somewhere else. And you came right. in to save their ass. Right. My I, opinion. <laughs> well, I don't, I, but I, I think that my my influence is pretty clear. Uh, the, I mean, it's just there in, in evidence. It's just there when you hear what happened. Tell us the, the records that, that the first things that you influenced there, the first things you were on. Just give us a little. Well, well the, the, fir the first were the dollar sign series. Uh, there was a blood curdling scream that I did that opens up. I believe it's time is money. And then I did uh, choral vocals, multi layers of vocals. You know, you do this on reels of tapes all the way through. There's no computer involved. And that was on um, Holy Money and Greed. Uh, Greed, I guess, came first. And, and um, so those choral vocals and then singing um, uh, a song to piano. Uh, I'm sorry, it won't happen again. That came in. And then that led to a B-side with Blackmail of me playing the keyboard and, and singing. That led to a tour where I didn't sing. I only played in Sonic Mirage. I told Michael, I'll either buy a bass because he wanted two bass players. I'll buy a bass and I'll learn it. And he said, well, Harry's leaving and he's been contributing sounds that he rolls you know, with a foot pedal and a cassette deck, bringing the volume up and down. So I replaced those cassettes with something. So the sampling keyboard just come out. 
So I learned how to use that thing. And Michael and I were making these samples. And so, I, so that's how that came about, me going on to the Sonic Mirage sampling keyboard, just playing bombastic, loud as hell sound. <clears throat> so that was an entire tour in front of skinheads and getting beaten up at Boston Roskeller, uh, knocked down steps by the, uh, the, the bouncers, who they were the, the doorman who refused to believe I was in the band because oh. I was a female. <clears throat> that was a legendary incident. They kicked me down the stairs. What happened after that? When you're kicked down the stairs? I mean, you go to the- Oh, I literally shit in my pants. I mean, it was unbelievable. Terrifying. Okay. And I mean, I had to go upstairs and clean up and then, and it was a completely packed, sold out show. And it's one of those shows where they had cut off the back entrance. So I had to that go- was to a horrible pl- That was a horrible place to play. Did you play anyway. it? Oh, it was horrible. I hated yeah. that place. Things like that happen all the time, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I'm constantly being screamed at, like, you know, show us your tits. And, uh, <laughs> okay, I have watch, to, cu- okay, Jarbo, I have to cut in. <laughs> that's I was, a good, that's a good one. I was opening for the Rollins band spoken word in Cincinnati or Cleveland. What the hell am I insane? Yes. Somebody said, show me your tits. Now, honey, my tits have been out and they're still good. I show him my tits. And this is when I used to have a, a mag flashlight, police. Fla- I'm like, now show me your dick. And the Rollins <laughs> band pulled their pants down. And I said, that's why they call it a mag light, because I need a magnifying glass to see it. <laughs> you can't out heckle me anyway. Anyway, look, I know you can't. I know. <laughs> very well know that. So, Jar- Jar- Jarba, I want to ask, because at least what I've read that you you had some, um, well, op- opera, jazz, you kind of. We're studying it or you're just or practicing it. Father, what, yeah, my father. Okay, yeah. You're with, with your father, but were there any, um, I don't know how deep you went into either, but were any particular artists in either fields that really had an impact on you until this day? Or, yeah, or Sarah Vaughn. Sarah Vaughn. Um, okay. I, I use uh, what's been described as like a, a natural, uh, uh, some people called it old fashioned. Uh, vibrato, vibrato. Bill Aswell, like I think a fast Bill one. Aswell called okay. it a old fashioned, but but anyway, that comes naturally to me. And of course, Sarah Vaughan was known for her, her vibrato, so I think that that's um, I'm not aware of, but it must have subliminally, you know, gotten into me because that did become a trademark for a while, the vibrato. Um, but definitely, it was definitely Sarah Vaughan. I want to talk more now about, you know, what happened after the swans. Anybody can look that up. And that lasted for quite a while. And it was an important part of your life. But you went Mm -hmm. on to then work with a variety of other people and truly develop Mm -hmm. your own sound, which has changed. And Mm -hmm. also, I really love your paintings. And you were one of the first Mm -hmm. people actually who was who had their own Internet store, who was selling stuff. You were one of the first people actually uh, manufacturing your own yeah. thing. So I want to talk about, OK, Swan, let's just cut to the chase with Swans, that beautiful and then horrific story. Anybody can go look up. It's over. Now, what do you do? So say Swans, it's done. We don't need to go through the horror story of it. I want to go into then the rebirth of Jarbo. Well, there were three things that I would say were somewhat pioneer, if you want to use that word. Um, one was uh, self-manufacturing the Anadoniac album, which was the first album that I did after Swans and you know, completely self-made and self-manufactured and self-sold from my website. And the other would be uh, putting a blog on, on, on when I had my own website, putting my, my blog, my journal on the, on the home page. What year was that? What which is what I continue to do. What, what uh, year now, did you start that, Jarba? What year did you start that? I think that, that was what, 99, I'm going to yeah, say. Very early. Yep, um, yeah, and, and also uh, self-releasing, constantly self-releasing. And, and then what I tried to do was, and then, of course, there were some labels along the way, but what I tried to do was to get all my work back from the labels when digital uh, streaming and download um, started happening. Now, I would have had that a a lot earlier on my website, the download, except for uh, the technical aspect of getting that kind of website. So finally, I was able to get that kind of website. And now, of course, um, with things like DistroKid, which is the one I use, you're able to do the streaming and the download all, you know, yourself. You don't need a record label. And that was interesting because when I finally got the work back from the labels, because I think most of them, they have a seven-year contract. So when I finally got the work back and was able to release it streaming and digitally, 
I started making, um, you know, a, a, a substantial income off of, off of that. Like, and I was like, wow, this is nice to actually make money from my well, music and, and, for a change. And, instead of getting a quarter or a dollar for every record sold or a penny, you're actually, and the thing is people have to realize this though. Yeah. Casually, you just said all that. It's a lot of fucking work. It's yeah. a lot of management, it's a lot of discipline, and it's a lot of work. And also you were releasing very special packaging with incredible photography and and also then doing your artwork, which mm -hmm. I, I just think is really, it's it's all very diverse and it's really beautiful stuff. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I love painting. I mean, I've got painters' hands now. I mean, they're regularly stained with paint now. <laughs> but I mean, I, I yeah, I'll put a lot of energy in, into the paintings and people uh, seem to like them, you know? I mean, I sell them all the time. And so I'm, I'm, I give everything I have into them too. We were discussing the nature of your collaborations and how did some of them come about after you were establishing your solo career? I think with Joseph, Joseph von Weissam, he uh, wrote, I came out with a list of albums that I was listening to for some magazine and he, and I listed his soundtrack, but only lovers left alive. And so he, he uh, wrote me and asked me to uh, sing on, on his album. And so that was, I loved that because it when, was a, when did that come out? I think it was earlier this year. What's, and, what's it? And, I love that film. And, uh, Oh, the oh the sound. Well, this was his new album. Yeah, his new album. And, and I love the film as well because the, you mentioned it. The film it. is brilliant. Well, that was why I, you know, I I mentioned that soundtrack, and then he had read that, and so he kind of so that collaboration kind of happened with me publicly mentioning I like that album. The soundtrack. Okay, and hold hold on for a second because what's interesting is. I was doing these recordings with Cypress Grove for the Jeffrey Lee Pierce tribute of which there's four albums. And there was one last poem of Jeffrey Lee's, which was I had to rewrite. And then I'm like, I want to do it with the music of the man you just mentioned and Jim Jarmusch. And mm -hmm. I went and took some of their music from Only Lovers Left Alive and put the poem mm -hmm. over it. And then they sent me a new track for that. So oh, good. It's an, and that has yet to come out, but it's also been very recent. Sometimes you just have to announce what you want to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, I love Squirrel. I, I love Jomish. Yeah, it's great, great music. I really want to recommend the show that's on YouTube that you did September 19th of 2019. I forget the club. It was a really ritualistic witchy performance. And to me, that was pure jarbeau. And most of the band was women, which was great. I think there was, was there a cello or a violin? I really liked that show that you did in New York. I mean, I only saw it on YouTube. I didn't see, but it's up there. And I really recommend people to see it if they want a big mouthful of one well, side of what you do. The, um, I mean, I've done a lot of, you know, festivals I mean, and, and I've done Roadburn and, you know, I've done the, the Inferno Fest and I've done the Wave Gothic Treffen and I've done the Supersonic and I've done the Hell Fest. And I've, I mean, I've done a lot of these of these festivals, which are great. But what I really enjoy doing are the old, small, like really old churches throughout Europe and uh, art galleries and art venues. I, I, those are my favorite. And so this the last uh, few tours have been great because I've, I've made it a mandate wow. that I don't perform in rock clubs. And so it's been really great to get off of that circuit because before I found the agent, the agency that understood me, I was doing tours in, in, in these rock venues. And I, and that's, you know, that I'm not doing that kind of music. And so, and plus I don't like those venues really. I really don't. And, and some of them, I won't even go see friends that are performing in them because I can't stand being in them. So well, your mean, music it, also, your music lends itself to a more intimate space. I mean, yeah. I like I much prefer performing not with retrovirus, but with spoken word or with more alternative things. I much prefer a space where you can look everyone in the eye. I do, too. And it's a connect thing. You know, it's a, a connectivity. You're right there. And I like that. And I really for for years, I, I, I hated the stage. I got off the, st the band would be on the stage. The performers would be on the stage, you know, other than me. And I would get down and, and perform in front of the audience. Uh, I don't need monitors and, and I don't, I could just perform right, you know, right there with them. And those are great, great shows. I mentioned that before to you. And, and, and I even did a tour uh, 
where I, at the end of the show, was going out to every single person and looking them in the eye. And, and, I, and I stopped doing that because of one particular show where the energy off of a particular man was, was, uh, was really intense. And then I realized that I could be killed doing this. <laughs> so, so, so I stopped, uh, I stopped that and I stayed on the stage. But yeah, I do like the smaller venues. And so this last tour that was canceled was really heartbreaking because it was everywhere I wanted to go. And I was thrilled. And so it it'll, was it'll come, start it'll, in, it'll come back. Started start in April. And then, Eventually. you know, and we all ready to go. We'd rehearsed. It was multimedia. We had a film. We had everything ready to go. And so that was terrible. So who knows? We're just going to have to wait and see, you know, when it's even humanly possible. Because right now, there's nothing no. humanly possible no. to do anything. You can't even travel now. So it's all kind of horrible for us performers. The reverberation in, in churches and even most art galleries are pretty live. Is that an acoustic sound you prefer with your latest works? Just the, just the super, I mean, cause that's all with a, with a rock band. That's all. It's very hard to control rooms like that, but with what you're doing now, that I, what I'm getting at it, it besides just the general ambiance, and the way it looks, is, is that also a, a acoustic choice that you're consciously thinking of? I think the control and the fact that I don't like to rely on monitors, I think the control that you have when it's, you know, a smaller acoustic uh, venue for, say, you know, a chamber ensemble or something like that is, is what I prefer. Um, when I've done the really loud, like, like we did... Um, the Roeburn Festival. It was the, the, when we did the Roeburn. They the venue. It was unbel- It was completely packed. It was a, a mob scene of people in there. It was a church. It was just so loud that I couldn't really get a sense of a, a sense of the space of the music. You know what I mean? And so it was great to perform there. But at the same time, it's a, it's a loss of of um, creating the world that, where you're controlling every little nuance of your voice and every little nuance of every inch, every instrument, every note. Yeah, and that's yeah. and important. That's in, in, in extreme volumes, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's suddenly one dynamic as opposed to many. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, what, it's what I really, it's what I really love about spoken word is that, the, that done correctly, there is an incredible amount of musicality and control mm-hmm. and hypnosis and intimacy yeah. and penetration and yes. it's very satisfying to me especially if i feel that i'm saying something that's causing kind of a brain freeze and i go on and they're still stuck in an image that to me is just the most absolutely satisfying thing they mm-hmm. will they will catch up eventually i love it yeah and it's no, what you're that's saying true. yeah it's what you're saying i mean as much as i love performing with music trust me but it's exactly what you were just saying about the control and the the nuances in the voice, mm-hmm. which then well, nothing the, is obliterating. The two, I mean, two, you know, examples of just the the decibel level being part of the part of what you're experiencing on stage, and that would definitely be swans, but it would also be neurosis. So yeah. That just just literally, you could feel the electricity in the air on that stage, and I did enjoy returning to that when I worked with them live because it was familiar to me, you know, because I had been through it for so many years in Swan. So it was familiar to be into where you feel like the stage is electrified, like on fire, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, but then the spoken word I've done a couple of times, I did a spoken word festival and, um, oh, what is that beautiful city, the beautiful town at the bottom of Spain? Um, The the Marat, the Moorish, what? Uh, Alhambra. There's many yeah. beautiful cities. No, no, it's, oh, so, it's, the, it's, I think it's the second biggest oh, no, Moorish. city. No. Moorish, Mo- Moorish, like it has a, has a very Moroccan uh, look to the buildings. Anyway, I did a spoken word festival there. Uh, it, was, it was really, really cool. I think Richard Held was also performing at, at the festival. And I did um, a, with the Necromonicon. Uh, Lydia, have you done that, the Necromonicon? I haven't done that now. Uh, that's, that was cool. That happens every two years. And that I did spoken word deliberately. And I had, uh, I had uh, in- instruments. I had a man playing a gong. I had Chris Forrest playing violin. I had Peter playing guitar. But I also and I had uh, 
a brain, an old brainwave machine that that Brett was playing. And I did folk and word thing. Was it Malaga or Cordoba or? No. Doesn't matter. There's so many great cities in Spain. I'll find it in a minute. So anyway, you're using music, but then you're you're translating your words into spoken word. What was the material that you were doing in spoken word? Was it diary enters? Was it stories? Was it poetry? Well, I wrote I wrote a surrealist, uh, a long sur- series of surrealist poems, uh, and and uh, so I read from those, and those are perfect for the Lovecraft uh, Festival because there's very surreal imagery, and I did enjoy that. And what I did was, is I had uh, I, I had my voice where I recorded it. And, and more of a childlike voice. And then I did my natural voice. And so I, I would play the childlike voice um, uh, recorded and then I would perform, read my, my natural voice. And so that kind of gave a psychedelic dimension to it. And, but yeah, it's called the Feast to Forget Time. And so it, it, it was a, a, a deliberate um, you know, foray into surrealist imagery. And uh, I'm, I'm, I really worked hard on it. It took, uh, oh gosh, around a year to actually finalize all those words. <laughs> and, and so it was really great. You know, to Gerbo, I just, I have to say, you know, words, whether they're sung or spoken, ultimately mm-hmm. it's out one hole and in another when it's live. <laughs> and if it, if anything penetrates within, between your mouth and the two holes in people's heads where it penetrates, Mm-hmm. that's what you hope for. But literally yeah. it's air and it's beautiful because again, back to the nuances. I mean, we could read the telephone book, darling. You can talk in a childish voice. You can talk glossolalia. You could be speaking <laughs> in Baptist tongue, but if you have the right tonation, yes. you could still be impregnating or communicating. Mm-hmm. That's just, right. Just saying. That's right. Just saying. Yes, I know. I know. And I did notice the uh, reaction to some of the things that that I said. So I relate to what you're what you're talking about. And plus, I've, I think it's a good uh, exercise to do the spoken word and not, uh, uh, you know, in, in, for a vocalist. I think it's a good exercise to do both. And I've done it. I've done it with recordings as well. All my albums have a spoken word on them. I've brought a few people to the spoken word stage for the first time. And often uh, some of them were just so terrified they never went back, even though as a rock singer, they'd be extremely exhibitionist. I find it an absolutely powerful dimension as much as I do playing with music, but it can scare the pants off of a lot of guys when you tell them, hey, why don't you read (laughs) something you wrote, honey? (laughs) (laughs) Well, anyway. But anyway, Sabia, Sabia, they pronounce it Sabia, Sabia. That is where the spoken word okay. festival okay. was. I'm surprised you weren't down there doing it. <laughs> well, I, you were saying the very south. I was trying to locate further south, but uh, yeah. I've, I've done a lot. I did a lot of performances when I lived in Spain there. I want to go back to the collaborations. Like, for instance, yeah. Colin yeah. Marston. I mean, how did that happen and what was that all about? Well, I did a, um, a spin magazine years ago. They asked me to, they gave me that blind okay. listening test thing that they were doing. Okay. And so they sent me music with no uh, information. Uh, uh, and of course, I didn't, I didn't have the name of the track or anything. And uh, so uh, there were several uh, tracks that stood out. One was by Yezu, Justin Broderick's project. And the, and the other was by Bila, which is, Colin and Kevin. And did you know them before that? No. And so I was going crazy for this uh, track, these two tracks by these two different. And so I wrote, uh, you know, about it in the magazine. And then they saw that and they read that. And that's how we um, connected. And then we did a, uh, they were doing. Kevin Huffnagel? Was it Kevin? Oh yeah, I love yeah, I love yeah, Kevin. Yeah, oh my yeah. God, I love Kevin. So so. Uh, and what was that was collaboration just, like? What was the music, or what was your part in that? Well, the first thing we did was very interesting because it was totally different than the track that I had reviewed in the magazine. It wasn't melodic at all. It was just kind of harsh and and uh, you know aggressive and, and electric guitar and just very kind of. And they wanted me to. Um, well, I could do anything I wanted, but I decided to do some growly kind of low guttural voices, like tonal voices. And 
really, it was a brutal recording session because they had to put a bucket at my feet because of so much saliva was just pouring <laughs> down oh my God. my mouth, <laughs> down, all, down, because I was just literally like growling the entire time. So really, so as opposed to, you see project. no, you see no words. The guttural growl was another yeah. instrument. Beautiful. Just, yeah. Tonal. Yeah, so that was of, the first full thing. of juice. But you're, so you're also was, working like fade, fade. I, I, I know we have a that few was the first around. thing we did. That was the first project. But then, see, I did the Mahakali album, and that album had a budget for the studio, and I used Colin's mm-hmm. studio. So I recorded uh, some of that at home in my home studio, and then I took files up there, and then we. We did. We had live musicians come in, and 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 uh, like like Vinny Cinerelli and and uh, yeah, we had and, yeah, we had with Julia Kent. I mean, we had different people come in and play in his studio. So and that for those, was the and for those, way. let me just interrupt because for those who don't know who Colin Marston is, first of all, he's one of the most insanely talented guitar players who can play anything and usually overplays everything to an almost incomprehensible degree. Yeah. And he also has an incredible studio, which a lot of people record at. And he's also a really nice guy. Yeah, yeah. no, I love to see uh, yeah. Sing just with me alive is really amazing just to watch their oh, hands yeah. move. And I've been very, very excited uh, every time they have I've been able to see them. I have. Um, but I have to were, ask uh, this personal question. Has any guitar player whose hands you like to see move in that way, moved across your body in a way that actually you could appreciate. <laughs> Just think about that for a minute. I'm sorry. I had to get that in there. I prefer drummers myself, but you know, sometimes or whatever. Actually, I prefer plumbers. They toured with Gorguts Gor- oh, yeah. when they and when they played, uh, I, I went downtown to the rock venue down there. Oh, it was a it was a big deal for me to <laughs> go down there and I would only do it for them. So I went down there and so they mm-hmm. uh, they stayed. They spent the night with me and they they um, there. They've stayed with me a couple of times. They stayed at the Mother Crow house that I don't live in anymore where you visited. They stayed there. And then they stayed up here in Roswell and they um, answer the question, cool. Jarbo. Did they use oh, their hands no. in the ways they should no. have? OK, just, <laughs> no. I had to, I had to, I, I can only I imagine. Have found a, I have not found a connection uh, with musicians in, in that. I have not found any. Uh, you know what? I'm sure it, it exists, but I've not <laughs> never experienced it myself. OK, so again, I, as I said, <laughs> sometimes I prefer plumbers to drummers. <laughs> but uh, I can only imagine what you prefer, Jarbo. You can reveal it or not. It doesn't matter. I am. Uh, no, I'm ba- I'm like Miss Isolationist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like. Am I right? Being isolated, you're, you're doing pretty well, right? I mean, you're being productive or are you having moments of just like, oh, my God, or you're just like, nope, eyes on the prize, just Pot, you know, plow through all these. I don't things. think it's. Uh, I don't think it's really healthy psychologically to to uh, stay too long uh, inside, no, not to be able to. Because I mean, yeah. in my case, I've been in um, pretty, since April. I haven't been. I haven't gone out. I've gone you know, random trips. Random trips to the grocery store wearing right. a mask. But, but you I ride your bike. You well, ride no, your it's bike. A station, it's a stationary oh. bike. Oh, come it's, on, it's honey, a, go outside. You it's can... a Zoom Echo bike. Yeah. But anyway, the point is, is that I, I, um, I think that um, you know, it's been very important to me to stay healthy, to stay well, because I can't have anything touching my lungs. I can't have any potential damage to my lungs. So right. I'm not going to, I'm not risking it. I know people that have been traveling and stuff. You couldn't, no way you couldn't pay me to get on a plane and go anywhere right now. So, yeah. So it's hard. It's hard psychologically because you feel kind of contained, you know, and I could, I leave, you know, that sense by creating music. I go into another world that way and I have to do that. I think you can relate to that. So you have to do that as a musician, you have to create, create a world that you can go into when you're, when you're basically confined. Look, as a, as, a hu- as a human being who lives this many decades, you have to be adaptable. Things have to change. You have to find new ways to entertain yourself and others. You have to deal with technology to the best of your ability. You just can't let the powers that be, even if it's an invisible enemy, like a pandemic of which there will be more, stifle you 
from whatever pleasure or creativity you can wring from this life, because it does become a psychological lock show. But no, you don't really have to fall into that. We do need human contact. This is true. We need human contact. And now it has to be by Zoom, by audio. But you still you can still reach out and you have to reach out or you have to reach really deep in. I have no problem for the most part in isolation because I just play with myself all the time. (laughs) I'm never bored. (laughs) Are there any musicians out there that you think uh, you'd like to collaborate at some point in in the future that you haven't yet? But you're like, you know what? I think I could pull that off. Is there anyone on a on a wish list or a dead or alive? Oh, well, I, okay, yeah, fine. Right. Dead or well, alive. That's, you'd have to have asked that, me that yeah, a while yeah. ago to prepare to answer that. Okay. Being dead and alive. No, but, alive. Uh, no. Uh, no. I mean, no, I don't really. I mean, I used to have that list. I used to, um, I, I used to always want to work with Tricky. Uh, someone I've been my I really, many, I many really, years. I really love the early tricky stuff. I have to say, yeah. it's so sexy, mm, very sexy. And um, but yeah, you know, I'm not. I'm actually, I'm actually happy just working completely by myself. Like I didn't really need to collaborate with other yeah. artists. I actually like controlling the entire thing, <laughs> and uh, I enjoy the challenge of that. And I've gotten pretty good at that. I've gotten really good, I think. At, you know, the performing, the engineering, the mixing, the the whole thing alone. And so that's, that's very satisfying to just create this, you know, your, your world and it's all you, you know, but But, I I mean, I I, I do, I do continue to do, I'm I'm working on two different collaboration things right now. I'm working with uh, some tracks with Thor Harris, who, you know, was in Swans and I'm also working with Brian Castillo him I've worked with before, but I mean, I, I prefer um, with my own work to kind of keep it um, just because I'm very, very, very particular about mixing and editing. And, you know, and so I just, it's, so if I collaborate, I have to, I let go of that and I become someone else, something mm. else. Also, Jarbo, so I just interviewed Thor for my documentary on artist depression, anxiety, and rage. Yes, I, you know what Such I started a, to say? Perfect person a lovely, to interview for lovely, it. lovely guy. Look, I like to create, you know, I like to do my own psycho ambient soundtracks alone as well, but I love to collaborate with other people. And I always feel it's a really equal marriage when I work with other people because I don't have to, con- I, I want to encourage them. I don't want to control them at all, but mm-hmm. it, you know, there's just, and, but also like you, like, because you couldn't name anybody, there's nobody I sit here wanting to collaborate with. My mm-hmm. projects dictate who the collaborators are. And I think it's kind of the same way with you. Mm-hmm. We don't yeah. have a list. We don't, I don't have a list. It's like, uh, no, it's if the, the if the project dictates a collaborator, it's the, the concept that dictated it. I don't sit here with a want list because the concept mm-hmm. comes first. You're right. You're exactly right. It's it's I completely uh, agree with that. Yes. <laughs> well, Charbo, many more projects I'm sure we will both have. I'm so glad to be back in touch with you. This has been the Lydian Spin with Charbo, multimedia <laughs> music, multimedia artist, musician, painter, and the list goes on. Basically ritualistic, witchy Mm -hmm. performer who will (laughs) penetrate your mind. Go to our website, Lydia and Spin, Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl. Thank you very much, Sharpo. Thank you, Lydia. Thank Thank you. you.